Your Excellency Dr. Tedros, Director General of WHO, colleagues and friends. The last time I gave a keynote speech on cancer in conflict zones was in Cambridge, England in 2022. At the time, the all-consuming global topic was the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war was a seminal event for many of us at the time for many reasons. Of course, firstly, we were all very concerned to see a new war erupt in Europe. And naturally, as fellow human beings, we were very sad and worried, particularly for the ordinary citizens who are often bear the brunt of such proxy wars. However, as the war unfolded, we saw something else, a refreshing new way of unprecedented global solidarity. The Security Council, UN agencies, the EU, the human rights and international law organizations all aligned as one, calling for respect of the Geneva Convention, the non-targeting of civilians, the respect of all international human rights laws, and vis-a-vis -vis health in general, and cancer in particular, we finally saw the beginning of the acknowledgement of cancer and cancer patients as part of the emergency actions during times of conflict. First ladies and hospitals in adjoining countries were collaborating beautifully to save cancer patients. I remember though having conflicted feelings. Happy that finally cancer patients are now actually taken into account during war and feeling hopeful that this would be finally the start of institutionalizing cancer patients support as part and parcel of the humanitarian system during times of conflict. On the other hand, I also felt disappointed, sad, and I must say envious on why the same standards and solidarity that we saw in the Ukraine did not apply to our people during conflicts in our region, who suffered the exact same horrors as other civilians, but are unfortunate to not be endowed with the same genetic makeup of being blonde and blue eyed. I voiced that concern at the meeting at the time. Little did I know then that a year and a half later in 2023, during Israel's genocide on Gaza, I and many people around the world would be gutted, devastated, shocked, stunned, and horrified when the whole humanitarian infrastructure, norms and laws not only were erased, but literally raised to the ground in one blow. We were thrown back to the dark ages. Provision of food, water, shelter, hygiene, which are the basic tenets of emergency care during conflicts, were and still are completely denied to a whole civilian Palestinian population of two million people. Furthermore, health facilities, health personnel, Ambulances, can you believe it? Ambulances, pharmacies, medical stores, medical storage facilities, whether owned by Gazans or the UN supposedly protected facilities were all targeted as collateral damage. Even the Red Cross and the Red Crescent did not escape the onslaught. The Geneva Convention was dead and buried under the rubble as the whole of Gaza. Instead of calling for improving and building on the steps taken for cancer patients in the Ukraine war, we were now calling for the basic tenets of survival, reduced to calling for food, water, fuel for hospitals and medical trucks to enter, calling for a measly ceasefire to tend to the wounded. We were even reduced to calling for the availability of anesthesia and alcohol so that surgeons did not have to disinfect patients with vinegar, nor to amputate children's limbs without anesthesia. Yes, the humanitarian system was reduced to calling for basic compassion for wounded children and civilians. And astoundingly, the calls fell on deaf ears. 
Forgive me for being very pessimistic and despondent, but it is extremely hard to cling on to any shred of optimism right now when we see that even the UN, UN chief, WHO, UNICEF, Doctors Without Borders, Human Rights, and other respected organizations have also been relegated to begging the UN Security Council for the application of the Geneva Con Convention, which they have ratified, and for the protection of health during times of war. And wait for it, for the security, for the UN Security Council to veto such non-political, purely humanitarian and legal requests several times. I and Professor Richard Sullivan penned an open letter at the start of the conflict to all cancer organizations in the world to weigh in and speak up for the implementation of the Geneva Convention, protection of the safety and health of civilians. I was stunned to see many organizations struggling and scrambling to write a coherent, authoritative, non-political statement in support of simply protecting the lives of civilian population during war, including cancer patients in times of conflict, let alone a genocide unfolding live before us. We did not ask anyone to weigh in on the politics of the conflict. No one would be qualified to do so anyways. That's not their job. We just wanted all medical organizations whose DNA is all about protecting human life to weigh in on the humanitarian norms that should be followed during times of conflict. We wanted the global medical and cancer organizations all over the world to add their weighty independent voices to support the Geneva Convention and to support the UN organizations and global multilateral humanitarian legal system, which were being weakened and enfeebled day by day in the eyes of the whole world. Instead, we saw weak and feeble statements. We also heard about doctors and medical personnel censured by their affiliate medical organizations for supposedly being pro-Palestinian. Asking for the respect of the Geneva Convention and for the protection of children and civilian lives is not being pro-Palestinian, but rather being pro-human. This global summit is called the Global Summit on War and Cancer. It should now be called the Global Summit on the Cancer of Silence During War. What is at stake here is not just the global failing of protecting Gazans and Palestinians. It is far, far more serious than that, my friends, and with grave repercussions that will reverberate long in the future. The fact that the protection of health for civilians during conflict has been shown to be no longer a given sacred right as sanctioned by international laws means that other future conflicts and warlords will now take note. They will take note that they can now weaponize health in times of conflict. They will use health as a sick, useful tool to subjugate whole populations into submission with complete disregard for all international laws, as they have seen that they will not be stopped, nor will they be held accountable, taking us all back, literally, back to the barbaric ages. And the problem is that no one now has the right to moralize anything to anybody anymore. As we have seen the tale of two cities unfold right before our very eyes. The Ukraine war was one hopeful example of solidarity and respect of international laws. And the Gaza genocide was the extreme other, replete with double standards, hopelessness, and complete disregard for Palestinian human lives. We as the global medical community cannot let that happen for all civilians caught in war, not for the Ukrainians, 
not for the Russians, not for the Israelis, Palestinians, Armenians, Yemenis, Sudanese, Syrians, and any other nations affected by war. Not even for the devil incarnate. That is the whole point of the Geneva Convention after all. We as the medical and cancer community have the responsibility to add all our collective voices clearly, loudly, and unequivocally to the side of humanitarian international laws. We as the medical community should be the first to call for the protection of our medical colleagues who are slaughtered and the medical facilities that are targeted, the least we can do. We should be the first to state that we abhor not only the intentional breaking down of international humanitarian infrastructure during wars, but also reject the interference of power politics polluting and weakening that framework. We simply cannot let the Gaza genocide become the model for defining future humanitarian care and rescue. And we can and should do more than that. We can still call for cancer patients to not be forgotten during conflicts. During the Gaza genocide, we saw how difficult it was to get seven cancer patients to come out of Gaza to Jordan. Despite having St. Jude Children's Hospital and WHO intervening, St. Jude funding their transfer and the King Hussein Cancer Center agreeing to receive and care for them at their own cost. It took this effort more than two months of work for it to happen. And there are still many more cancer patients waiting for deliverance. Many would have died by now probably more from starvation, sickness, other sickness, infectious disease, shock and stress. That, more from that than from cancer at this point. We see warships mobilized so quickly in times of war. Why can't we see medical hospital ships mobilized immediately in the same way? So that at minimum care for the sick can start whilst the horrible politicking is sorted out. This could be something we should all call for as an example. And we can utilize the global medical volunteers who are more than ready to offer their vital services. I may be naive, but we do need to put our heads together and come up with an institutional framework to support cancer patients whose cancer does not stop for wars, on the contrary. Cancer loves wars because wars provide cancer its safety from annihilation. Wars provide cancer with the sparse terrain with no opposition for its deadly work. No, chemo no chemotherapy in sight, no radiotherapy, surgery, and all other tools to stop its deadly advance. Cancer simply thrives in wars and in refugee bodies. We, as the medical community, need to step up now more than ever to protect and safeguard the sanctity of human life during war. We need to say loud and clear that we reject the killing and destruction of humanitarian and international legal and human rights infrastructure. We should shout at the top of our lungs that we will not justice, equity, and humanity become main collateral damage in wars. What happened and still happening in Gaza genocide should never happen again, never to anyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>